Okay, this is um, the crank assembly for a 1930 Royal Enfield Model K 1000cc V-twin and um, I've had the whole engine stripped down and the crank stripped right down it's had a full um, overhaul and it's provided a little bit of entertainment and uh, cliffhanger moments here and there um, including a cracked flywheel which I'll come to in a moment but this is hopefully the finished article um, I've got a new crank pin in it I've got new big end rollers in it and I've even fitted new outer races for the big ends into the conrods and honed them out myself until they were a good fit with the smallest of three sizes of rollers you can get for these so there's room for it to wear so perhaps in the next hundred years or so it might need rebuilding again with uh, the next size up but uh, it should see my generation out all being well um, I've also got new small end bushes in the conrods which are uh, reamed to size and the uh, cranks back together and trued up and I'll just give it a little spin here you can see that on the left the gauge reads in uh, thousandths of an inch we're getting about two thousandths of an inch there a bit of roughness in that center actually I need to get a new one so we've got about two thousandths of an inch there and this one is metric but what it's showing us from one uh, number to the next is 0 0.1 of a millimetre or four thousandths of an inch so we've got about three thousandths of an inch at most there so we put that together and bear in mind that the clock's needles are rising and falling together one cancels the other out so in actual fact we've got a real world one thousandths of an inch run out there on the uh, shafts so that's very very good I'm more than happy with that um, now we're going to take a look at the old flywheels which um, I had a scary moment when I realized that there was a crack in the time inside flywheel where the crank pin fits and we'll just go over there and have a look at the old crank pin and the old flywheels I was lucky enough um, and thanks as well to Alan Hitchcock at Hitchcock's Motorcycles for putting me in touch with someone who had these because uh, they're probably quite thin on the ground now that's the original drive side flywheel um, nothing wrong with that one this is the time inside flywheel which if I turn it over whether the camera will pick it up or not I don't know um, but in here when I push the new crank pin in you can see these holes are drilled here they're at the ends of cracks that either either appeared or were there before it's difficult to tell really but uh, either way when the new crank pin was in and home you could see cracks there so uh, I knew there was a problem and it's also apparently not unknown for this to happen to these flywheels so when the new uh, crank pin uh, what happened was here's the old one and that drops in there and it's well there's a you press it and there's a very very slight wobble well the new crank pin was even slightly more wobbly than that in both these old flywheels and the ones over there so what I did I have no choice really because these flywheels are cast iron there's no giving them uh, steel flywheels will give a little bit when you press a tapered crank pin in uh, cast won't you'll just get to a point where they'll crack uh, which in the case of this one it had either happened sometime before or happened when I was trying to fit the new crank pin although I don't recall getting up to the point of using much force on it um, but anyway what I did with the flywheels we got over there and the new crank pin I decided as there was a tiny sort of wobble that I would lap it in with very very fine grinding paste and oil um, and literally just lap it for half a minute or so then clean it all off and just check again because obviously I didn't want it to go too far because you are actually reducing the overall width of the assembly as the crank pin settles into the flywheel but in the end 
I got to a point where the crank pin would just sort of drop into the hole under its own weight and actually sort of stay put so it was gripping the hole well. The crank pin and the uh, boss that it fitted into in the flywheel were both matched perfectly to each other and that's what we've got over there. So I did that with both ends of the crank pin in both flywheels. So um, it all went together nicely, it's trued up nicely of course and uh, the, uh, the nuts on the end of the crank pin are certainly done up tighter than they were when I undid them to dismantle the original crankshaft but again I was a bit wary about doing them up too tight because obviously you're pulling a tapered hard steel pin into a cast iron flywheel so theoretically you could probably tighten to a point where bang you get a crack in the flywheels and that was the last thing that I wanted so uh, you just had to use a little bit of I suppose common sense and uh, cross my fingers a bit but the uh, the nuts done up nice and firmly and the uh, flywheels are nice and firm against each other nicely trued up so I'm hoping that these can go into the engine and just sort of play their part in being able to make a nicely renovated engine that will be more or less like new and ready to go for many many thousands of miles so my next uh, stage will be to uh, get these ready to put into one of the crankcases I'm all okay for the, uh, the timing side main bearing I've got a little bit of a hurdle to get over on the drive side um, and that is that we've got a new main shaft there and it's just because new outer races for the crankcases aren't available so I'm going to have to conjure something up to uh, overcome some pitting in that um, but I'm sure we'll get over it and once that one's cleared and uh, a solution's been found then the engine can go back together and uh, be put back into running order I would think but that's where we're at for now and uh, that's one major headache sorted out so I'm very very pleased with that anyway here we have that crank assembly again um, from the Royal Enfield V-twin model K from 1930 that I've rebuilt um, as we saw in another video I've got new big ends in it and new small end bushes and I've checked the run out which was in the region of one thousandth of an inch on the uh, main shafts so I'm happy with that um, I've got it held in a vice but I have got aluminium soft jaws there and the reason I've got it held like this you'll see in a minute the uh, oil feed to the big ends on these goes from the main bearings via a close fit to the faces of the main bearings uh, by this flat area here which is on both sides both flywheels so uh, there's an oil feed on either side um, I'm also going to have to repair that a little there um, there's a chip in that which seems to be a common thing as uh, all of them seem to have that to one degree or another I'll probably build that up with some uh, Devcon and uh, blend it in anyway I'm not going to be too worried about that because the Devcon will hold for definite um, the oil hole you might just be able to see is there and what we've got, there it is there, we've got a corresponding oil hole obviously on the face of the other flywheel down there and then there's two holes in the crank pin feeding the big ends themselves so what I'm going to do is just to verify that all the oilways are clear right through from one to the other, one side to the other if I put this spray cam pipe into the feed hole on this side and give it a blast let's see if we can see anything coming out here hopefully the camera will pick that up I'm seeing it that is the old uh, WD-40 passing right through from one end of the crank assembly to the other so that tells me that both oil feed holes on the drive side and the timing side are capable of picking up oil and sending it through to the big ends which is what we want so they're going to get their oil no problem no questions so uh, that 
that's another very very worthwhile check on a crank assembly like this uh, just to make sure that the oil holes between the crank pin ends and the flywheels are all lined up and oil is able to pass right through and uh, in this case it can so that's not a worry. This is a 1930 um, Royal Enfield 1000cc V-twin model K engine that I'm working on um, to rebuild and so far we've had um, a new crank pin and uh, big end rollers and hard eyes in the con rods which I've honed in and I've totally rebuilt the crankshaft with not only the new big end and crank pin and so on but also a new drive side main shaft the timing side main shaft was okay I fitted new small end bushes into the con rods and reamed them ready to accept the uh, gudgeon pins to hold the pistons in place but although I've got the timing side sorted and uh, a new outer race fitted this is the old one for the time inside main bearing new rollers and the main shaft itself being okay um, this side's not a worry um, the drive side didn't fare so well um, now I've got a new main shaft in it and I've got new rollers for the main bearing but the problem is I couldn't get a replacement for the outer race on the drive side it's a bit unusual um, and unfortunately, whether the camera will pick it up or not, but the, uh, the, race, the surface of the race is quite pitted and a bit rough. So it certainly wouldn't work very well just to sort of stick new rollers into it and uh, put it together because it'd probably rumble and start wearing out quite fast. Um, another thing is that on both crankcases, both sides have oil feeds which go through the main bearings and eventually find the oil finds its way along into these little recesses in the crankshaft to go on to the uh, to go on and feed the big end bearings see this sort of uh, well around here the oil comes out of the main bearing into there there's a little hole that picks up that links up with a hole in the crank pin on this side and is similar on the other side and that's how oil gets to the big end so whatever I do here I need to allow oil to get through to the big end so it's no point me just fitting some sort of bearing which won't allow the oil through um, and if I turn it over you can see an oil hole there and there's another one there to correspond with these two channels where the oil gets flung around and it runs down the channels through those holes into that groove there there it lubricates what would have been the original main bearing this loose roller bearing and any surplus oil afterwards would go out through the side of it and into there and feed the big ends because there would be a felt seal in the back of that stopping the oil going out to the outside so I had a problem in that it was quite easy to conjure up with conjure up a bearing arrangement to support the main shaft but I also had to get oil to the big end and after considering a number of possibilities I've come up with this this is an old bearing a new one this is a brand new one right there in the bag which will be fitted to the engine this is an old one and as we can see it's got an oil hole there and a nice channel right in the middle of it so what will happen this bearing I'll put a seal in first an oil seal to stop oil getting out to the outside so an oil seal will go in there then possibly if there's room a shim washer of some sort maybe and then I'll follow it up with this now the, the groove in the back of this bearing that links up with the little oil hole there just corresponds nicely with the groove in there so that when the bearing is in place oil will get through it now, may or may not actually drop in this one because it's an old one it's been a bit, a bit warm but I might have to use some bearing fitting compound with the new one but I've already measured and worked out that when that bearing is put in there and is left flush with the face that the oil channels line up nicely so the oil seal will be in behind the bearing this will go into the engine 
like that and then the oil will pass through it in the normal way come out there and head straight for the big end on this side so a full lubrication potential for the big ends will be maintained and I'll have overcome a problem of not being able to get a very rare main bearing for the drive side of this engine um, by putting something else inside it and the bearing race, the rollers, will run direct on the main shaft which is not ideal but is what would have happened originally with this one and bearing in mind that the uh, engine, the bike is 90 years old now it will probably be a long time before anyone has to worry about the main bearing or the main shaft again anyway with any luck so I'm going to get everything ready to put together and uh, hopefully fairly soon I'll have a complete bottom end ready to go back into the frame all being well so another big step forward I think right this is the Royal Enfield um, V-Twin model K engine that I've been working on and I've had some fun and games with the main bearings and the big ends and so on um, I'm just about ready to show you that uh, the bottom end is ready for permanent reassembly um, I've been trying it out I'll just take this off and we'll go through it all. Right, here we are. We've got this the timing side, which has got a new outer race for the main bearing, uh, new rollers. The cage was reused, but it's got new rollers in there. And this uh, spacer or washer is one that I've machined and made up. You can see the eight little sort of channels that I filed in the face of it there. There to allow the oil. Uh, which is fed to the big end from the main bearings on both sides to get through past the main shaft and into this channel which leads to a hole and uh, onto the big ends uh, both sides of the crank are like that um, the big ends are fed from both sides also I've machined this uh, spacer, thrust washer, call it what you like to be the right thickness to put the crankshaft right on the centre line, the conrods are right on the centre line of the crankcases and then um, any clearance or end float issues were to be dealt with with this one which I've done uh, that's been in and out of the lathe a couple of times and now we've got to a point where the crank will fit in the crankcases um, all go back together and there'll be absolutely no clearance or end float but they don't bind either so I know that the faces are all going to be not tight but firmly against each other so that no oil will go where we don't want it to and it will all go through the main bearings and into the big end so I'm now going to put the crankshaft into the time inside the crankcase so it will be located by the washer that I've got in there that will put it where I want it relative to the uh, centre line of the crankcase and the conrods and then next now when I put this together for keeps I'll be oiling everything put this washer on there and you can see where the oil will get through those little channels that I filed uh, from the main bearing the main bearing is fed by splash through these two channels there's holes into it I've got an oil seal in there to stop the oil coming out on the drive side so oil goes into the main bearing by it's flung about and splashed caught in the main bearing oils that and then from there it comes out through those channels and towards the big ends so let's just uh, place this drive side crankcase on I've got this small washer here Now if I get the crankcases and stand them up, 
I'll just clamp them together just to simulate them being bolted together. just to even out the pressure and make sure that they're clamped together nice and firmly and straight. There we are. Now they're as close together, those two cases are as close together as they would be with the uh, nuts and bolts all fitted and tightened up basically. Bear in mind I'm also going to use some gasket sealant on the joint as well. And then we've got the crankshaft turning nice and freely and smoothly and if I can demonstrate it you may just have to take my word for it but I'll try there's absolutely no side to side movement or end float and yet the crank spins nice and freely so I know that the crank's not going to clatter about from side to side and uh, a good positive strong oil feed to the big end bearings will be maintained so i'm happy with that i'm going to take it apart one last time now and apply some sealant to the joint faces of the crank cases and um, this part of the engine can be bolted together and i can move on to the next stage of the rebuild so uh, i'm very happy with how this has gone and uh, it'll be nice to finally move on to another phase of the rebuild Well, it looks like it could be the big day, or the day of reckoning for me, and this uh, Royal Enfield Model K 1000cc V-Twin from 1930. Um, I think I'm at a point where I'm going to have to try and start it and cross my fingers, and uh, hopefully if all goes well, it'll start and run. But there's only one way to find out. As far as I know, everything's ready. So um, I've just got to... Uh, and a few little extra things you've got to do on these and that includes turning the oil on so the oil's on the oil pumps primed and I've got oil in the crankcase already um, also the oil pumps turned up to its highest setting see there it's got that little adjust, adjust a wheel on it and I'm on the highest setting for the maximum flow and input of oil so basically I think I'm ready to go. I've got sparks at the right time. I've got compression. The valves are opening and closing as and when they should. And uh, I've got fuel. So I'm going to turn the fuel on next. And if that doesn't pour out everywhere, because I haven't turned the fuel on yet at all since the uh, carburetor and the fuel pipes and everything have been done. That sounds promising. Tickle it up. Right, I'm going to put the camera down out the way and, uh, well, let's see, as I've often said before, what if anything happens. Although the ignition timing is supposedly right, 
I've got a feeling that perhaps it's not. Um, just in case but I don't think that's right right well if nothing else hopefully that's proof that when I really do try and start things for the first time that it's not a setup job and it really is the first attempt I'm going to check a few things over and uh, no doubt we'll have another try at this shortly I'm going to get my breath back and go and have my lunch Well here I'm back with this Royal Enfield Model K 1000cc V-Twin from 1930 and um, after a failed earlier attempt to start it, I went over a few things and double checked the timing and so on and found it was right. But <clears throat> what I did notice was, I think I had the um, spark plug leads on the wrong way round. I went um, front for front and rear for rear, which might seem to make sense. But um, on turning the engine over and uh, finding that the... Uh, points were opening for each cylinder where there was compression and having heard bangs, occasional bangs from the uh, silencers indicating that the spark was happening at totally the wrong time I swapped the plug leads over and uh, I'm just about to get ready to start trying again and see if we uh, get any sense out of it so my first attempt to start this since the rebuild failed um, this is the second attempt or take two so uh, Pull up the chair and let's see what happens. First of all, I know I've still got it in gear. Neutral. There we are. Right. I've got the oil on, there's an oil tap, and as I said in my earlier video, I've got the oil pump set on its highest setting. So I'll turn the fuel on now. get anything this time. A touch of a touch of retard on the ignition lever. I haven't got any choke on at the moment. Let's see what happens. First of all, I'll just tighten that twist grip up on the handlebar. It's fired. It tried. Let's try that. I'll actually, be able to give it some throttle now. Fantastic, I made up with that. What a beauty! What a happy day! I've almost lost sleep over this moment.
Oh, fantastic. What a fantastic engine that is. I expected a lot of smoke. I've got the engine full of oil because I wasn't running the risk of running anything dry and letting it tighten up or seize. Plenty of oil will be getting chucked around. That engine's fully rebuilt, new main bearings, big end, have done work on the crankshaft, the flywheels themselves. I even honed the big end eyes out myself so that the rollers would fit. Well, this could have been the make or break moment for me. I'm just over the moon with that. I'll be going out celebrating tonight if I can. If there's anywhere open to celebrate. <laughs> well, I'll have to knock a few more bits and pieces on the bike itself into shape. And then, I have to grip my teeth, take it for a test ride. But I'm just so happy with that. That's fantastic. I'm going to stop it now. That makes it all worthwhile when something like that happens. Sorry for the uh, shaky picture, but I'm shaking with excitement. This has been uh, building up for a long time, this moment, and we're finally there. And I couldn't have wished for better. Happy days. Is that Royal Enfield Model K running again? This is just going to be a short video. They have made up a replacement for whatever was missing holding a decompressor cable on. And I've got a cable made up and working. demonstrate the decompressor only seems to operate the one cylinder which would kind of make sense because if you knock the compression of one cylinder away you've only got to overcome the other one for starting when I decompressed it there it just uh, kept going on one cylinder so the other one was knocked out and uh, one Remain with full compression for running and starting, I guess. Well, bits and pieces of it and various aspects of the rebuild along the way have been seen in a few of my videos. And uh, we've even had the first unsuccessful start attempt followed by the second attempt which was successful. And now at last, having been up and down the lane on it a few times and checked it over and made a few adjustments, I'm confident enough to go a short way out the village on it. I'm not going to do my usual test circuit. Uh, I'll do a part of it and turn around and come back. Um, it's a 1930 Royal Enfield Model K, 1000cc. It's actually very similar to a Sunbeam that my great grandfather used to own, which I think was a bit older as, as it was a flat tanker. Um, so it's nice to be able to ride something a bit like what he had. His had a big sidecar on it, which is what this was intended for originally. But obviously um, we're going to be riding it solo now so I'll try not to bungle the gears and wobble around too much but uh, it's another hand change machine I've worked on a few it's not the oldest they go back to 1926 I think was the oldest an AJS that I worked on that was a lot smaller this is actually I think the biggest capacity engine bike I've ever ridden at a thousand cc Let's give it a short ride anyway, and I've not only got to turn the fuel on, but I've got to turn the oil on as well, because it's got total loss oiling from a compartment in what looks like the fuel tank. We'll notice the uh, two filler caps, one's for petrol and one's for the oil. on and uh, we'll give it a go. We're 
looking forward to this but also with uh, some trepidation as well but uh, it's time to do it it seems to start okay on full advance especially when it's warm just turning the oil and the fuel on it likes to have the carburetor tickled for pretty much every start let's see what happens
went rather well. I'm glad I didn't choose to go any further. I almost did. And we got a puncture in the front tyre. I thought it was starting to feel a little bit strange as we came in through the village. It seemed to be uh, wandering and wallowing and twitching a bit. So, obviously, I've got a, well, I won't say I've got a puncture to deal with because it'll have a new inner tube because I don't know how long that one might have been in there. And um, we don't want any mishaps, especially with the front end. So, that wheel will be coming off. I'll just stick a new uh, inner tube in that. Uh, I'll just put the camera down a moment because I think we've probably got plenty of time left on it. And uh, we can start it again. And Look at the sky amongst yourselves. Look at this mechanical marvel in all its glory apart from its flat front tyre, which looks a bit sad. If I uh, back the ignition off a little, has settled down now. I uh, deliberately put an overly large quantity of oil into the crankcase when I rebuilt the engine so there would be plenty of oil in there to get flung about when I started it up because I wasn't taking any chances. I didn't want this thing seizing up or doing damage after all the work I'd done on it. So it's obviously used up some of that now. The oil pump is actually set on number two at the moment. I might turn that back up to number three now things have settled down. The bike itself is faultless there really. I might have bungled one or two gear changes and the front tyre went down. But you can't blame the bike for any of that. Listen to that, that's music that is, isn't it? <laughs> well I'm more than happy with that. Everything worked fine, the gears, it's only got a three speed gearbox. Once you're in top gear and uh, you've got the room to manoeuvre, it doesn't seem to be phased by hills. It went all the way up that climb towards the next village in top gear effortlessly. I don't imagine it would be overly fast flat out. It's made and probably geared as well for a sidecar. Uh, nice, nice, pleasant machine to ride. Nice and relaxed, but. Uh, Probably not something you want to be out in among all the city traffic on, I wouldn't think, but uh, yeah, lovely. I'm glad to have been a part of this one's story and uh, brought it back to life and enjoy that little ride on it and uh, might possibly venture further on it at some time in the future. Let's see how we go. Royal Enfield Model K with lights. It's been a while since we've seen this uh, 1930 Royal Enfield 1000cc Model K in any of my videos. Um, I even rode it, I think that might have been the last clip where on the way back just before I got home the front tyre had gone flat on it due to uh, a split in the inner tube which I've sorted out since but uh, I haven't had the need to ride it since then um, and it's been a few months really since anything much was done on it but since the last video work's been done on the electrical system and um, we've now got 
everything working that it requires and the dynamos there and there's the battery box there's no actual battery on this it's got one of those uh, Boyer power boxes to convert the uh, or control the voltage from the dynamo so um, there's no battery so no lights or anything when the engine's not running and the guy who helped me out with this one he, he was here helping me out for a little while a friend Joao he did the electrical work on this and did a nice job of it and we managed to retain the original headlamp switch but this originally took charge of all sorts of functions even charging the battery and so on and there's all sorts of nasty damaged and uh, worn and redundant terminals in there a lot of that's been removed but he managed to keep the switch and keep the basic functions of it by altering the wiring and some other things so that is still a functioning switch and um, we've got off obviously the first click when it's running puts the front side light on on its own next click front side light and the uh, tail light on the rear will be on and that click the last one obviously puts the side light out and the headlamp on and the tail lamp also stays on and then we've got the uh, usual dip switch now I'll start the engine up shortly and we'll see the lights working the, uh, the pilot light or side light is quite bright the uh, headlamp is actually less so but it does actually work um, bulbs for these sort of lights are probably not everyday things that you could pick up at the uh, at your local motor world or whatever but at least we can see that the lights and the functions of the lights are working hopefully so uh, I'm not going to pull the wool over anyone's eyes I've run this engine already today um, I wasn't sure because it's been a few months how easy or difficult it would be to start but it did uh, it fire it fired up within three or four kicks and ran nicely so uh, I'm going to put the camera down now start it up and then we'll uh, have a look at the uh, the lights and the different functions we get from them from that switch also actually before I put the camera down uh, a few little details have been sorted out which haven't been attended to last time the steering damper strap or fixing bolts to the top of the tank there and that hadn't been fitted because this tank is actually it turns out a copy of the original and uh, not quite to scale apparently so the bolt hole in the end of this strap didn't reach the hole in the tank so I actually cut it and uh, raised a section in underneath and then filled in the gap with more braze on top and painted it so that's done um, there's what looked like a neat hacksaw cut through the rack there which uh, I've put an insert in it and brazed that up as well and repainted it so a few little things have been done um, I've got the uh, letters and numerals coming for the front number plate as well uh, so now I'll put the camera down and uh, start up try not to let the camera fall over there we are right well done. fuel on oil on on a fast idle for this side light side light off second click side light Third click, headlamp, tail lamp, dip, 
feet. Back to side lap and tail lap. Side light only on the front. Off. That's all working nicely. What a beautiful old engine. Listen to that. A better fast swipe with a kickstart would speed that engine up. Lovely old machine. And now fully functional with lights and everything. Very nice. Here's the uh, 1930 Royal Enfield 1000cc Model K that I've been working on over the last uh, year or possibly more. Uh, it's been in my workshop for a little while now and I'm just about at the point where I've finished with it I think. Um, we've already been for a short ride on this one on video um, where I didn't do my full usual test route but turned around just before the next village and thankfully I did so because um, I got a puncture in the front tyre before I reached home. Um, I put a new inner tube in it and uh, it's been idle for quite a while but um, I've done a few more little bits and bobs on it to hopefully bring it closer to being finished and completed. Uh, I may even be done with it. I've got the, uh, the lights are working now and uh, a few other little minor points attended to that needed looking at and um, I'm going to be getting ready to take a ride on it soon. I won't be going my full usual test route down to the roundabout. Um, I'll cut that short when I come down the hill rather than turning right for the roundabout. I'll turn left and come home. Also, I've been reading the old manual for it and uh, I've got the, there's an adjustable, there's adjustable settings on the oil pump and I've got it turned up to the maximum now. I did have it on uh, two and a half. I'll turn it right up um, because we'll be going up that hill towards the next village and then uh, coming back along the main road I'm not going to wring its neck and uh, if anything comes up on us from behind it'll just have to overtake us or stay behind us because I'm not going to be pressing this one uh, it's newly rebuilt it's 90 years old so it deserves a bit more respect than that but I'm going to get my uh, jacket and stuff on now and uh, get ready for a ride and hopefully we get a few miles on this and see what it's all about. Okay here we are with this 1930 Royal Enfield 1000cc Model K and uh, hopefully we're going to go for a short ride. I've got my open face helmet on for this run. Um, it's just a little bit easier to sort of look around behind you and generally be aware of other stuff that's around if needs be as there's no mirrors on this thing and uh, it's also a hand change so I want to have my wits about me as much as I can. Let's see if we can take a short ride up to the next village of Flansadron and uh, down the hill and back along the main road. I won't be taking in the roundabout. Fuel on, oil on.
beautiful flexible end you know. Better change down from top for this one, no. Mountains there ahead of us. Down to second gear again.
went nicely. I enjoyed that, although I think it could actually quite easily do with an extra gear completely over top gear or be geared up considerably. Um, it's definitely got to be on sidecar gear in that. Definitely, without a doubt, but it runs really nicely and it pulls so well, even from not even a well, tick over speed. Hot start, no problem. Beautiful pre-World War II glory. I actually had the lights on as well uh, while I was riding it, but when you stop the engine, if you start it again with the lights switched on, they don't come on. You go switch them off, get some revs on it, more than that. There we are. But once the lights go out, they don't come back on unless you switch them off. We tie the ignition, shall we? machine. Wish I could afford one of my own, but it's been fun riding it after doing all the work on it, but uh, I think it'll soon be time for it to go home. So I've got an eye opener riding something like that. Well here we are once again with this uh, 1930 Royal Enfield Model K, and I think I'm coming to, or may have even come to the end of everything I need to do with it. Just gonna have a look here. We'll see. I fitted a quite discreet brake light switch to it. Uh, I had all the lights working as we've seen in a video previously. I added this brake light switch as there was provision for a brake light in the rear light there. So um, we're now using the tail light and the brake light facilities on that. I've got this set up. And I've already tested it on a circuit tester. It is switching on and off as I press the brake pedal. But the other thing with this brake pedal is there was nothing to sort of stop it. It would just sort of flop upwards if you pulled it up. It didn't sort of click to a positive stop at all. So I've made up this little right angle stop here, which bolts on over the end of the brake pedal spindle. And it actually also doubles as a nice little extra support for the underside of the front exhaust pipe as well. So we've got the brake pedal coming to a positive stop now. Brake light switch being pulled on by the spring there. And my next job, if all goes well, is I'm going to try and get this one started up now and then we'll uh, hopefully confirm once again that all the lights work and the brake light works as well. And also finally got the Royal Enfield name on the tank as well and the uh, registration letters and numbers are on. So if it'll do us the honours of starting up now and just showing us that, that all the lights and the brake light works. I'll be a very happy bunny. As usual, we've not only got fuel to turn on, but oil to turn on as well. Tickle the fuel up. It's the first day of February today, 2021. Still very cold. Let's see what happens. Jump. 
full choke and full advance, I would say. Let's see if we can get anything. Side and tail. Headlamp. Once it warms up it will tip over even more steadily. It's got full choke on at the moment. Well, that was a very good cold start, second kick and that's been a good few weeks since it last ran. That's just to stop my eye getting taken out when I've been working on it. I don't want one of my eyes to end up like a pickled onion on a stick. A bit of plastic fuel hose. I don't think it will have warmed up enough yet, but I'll not be choked off now. Now we retire the ignition. Oh, go on then. Job done. Finally, another one ready to go home. Excellent. Lovely old bike.